Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this week's podcast. I am honored to have a guest, Oscar Trimboli, who's had a deep influence on me. And in fact, his podcast is called Deep Listening, Impact Beyond Words. It's an Apple Award winning podcast. Uh, Oscar and I will uh, smile at that one. And also he's produced a book, which just happens to be sitting back there, which says how to listen. And um I've really taken a lot from listening to the audio version of that, which is a, having the book is great, but have a listen to the audio version too. Um, Oscar is a good friend of another friend of mine, Catherine Tulpa. Um, we both work with the Marketing Academy, helping various CMOs who are thinking about becoming CEOs. Oscar's got great wisdom and experience. He's based in Sydney and is in great demand to f facilitate uh, leaders and teams events at this most senior level to the most junior level but also a great coach to other people. So being a listening expert is a bit of a large call. So Oscar, how do you manage to be an expert uh, without um, getting too carried away? Because you are very successful, but how do you keep your humility yet be an expert? Well, step number one, don't call yourself an expert. Uh, I, I've never add that, added that label to myself. I think the question you always want to ask yourself as the leader in the room, and the leader is anybody who influences another human, let's not confuse titles or hierarchies with that, is just this simple question. Uh, is what I'm doing in service of the room or myself? And that, that's always my point of calibration when, when I can feel the excitement from the unproductive part of my ego about to explode in excitement to the room, I notice I connect. I was like, okay, thank you. Excited part of the ego. Just if you just step over there for a moment, that's not in service of our group. And I think for many of us, it's that simple question is, is the question I'm posing in service of the group, the system, the ecosystem that we're part of, or is it self-serving? So for me, uh, it was taught to me on a job site. I didn't ever have a school holiday. My school holidays were spent concreting with my dad, with many migrants. And I learned the value of hard work there, but I also learned the value of connecting across communities that don't necessarily have anything in common. And there was a great professionalism in that group because if you get the concrete wrong, the foundations of the house fall over, you know, so you better get that right. But they um, always could have fun. They could always have a laugh at themselves. They never took themselves too seriously. And I think as a hat tip to my dad and my dad's generation and all those migrants that built the next part of our country, that's what keeps me humble, I guess. Mm -hmm. Well, look, I, I've really loved our earlier conversation that we had. I seem to remember dad's um if he's still alive he's 83 he's had a couple of strokes he was from italy yeah, he's still a, alive, a, yeah. yeah i'm so pleased about that uh d is it did he love test cricket and dare we even speak about test cricket in the ashes does he is he a big fan or is it you the big fan um i i, I love any form of cricket as long as it's test cricket and uh it was interesting because last week i was in a room that had a very significant debate about um, ethical decisions that CEOs have to undertake. And, and most of that conversation took place in a fairly professional way. And then the ethicist who had people in the room from India, from the United Kingdom, from Australia, decided to turn up the heat in the room and gave an example with regard to cricket and all, every leader's inhibition in the room went away and a very... Well, just a very energetic conversation took place. Now, my, my dad only believes in one form of ball sport, and that's football, the world game. And uh, But my dad educated himself very deliberately when it came to cricket. He came from a part of Italy where cricket probably wasn't played. And, uh, yeah, but he was always there quietly on the sidelines, noticing, watching, asking questions of the coach, and uh, I, I didn't appreciate then what I do now that just his presence was enough. Mm -hmm. And there were some kids who didn't have their dad there. He could have had many excuses and sometimes he was working and he, he still turned up. It might have been a bit late, but he still turned up. So, yeah, 
my passion and love for cricket uh, is a function of winning the genetic lottery and being born in Sydney. <laughs> mm. Well, well, that, that takes me on to, I, I was always very interested um, in previous podcasts in a certain format, and we discussed this, I'm going to go a bit free flow today. I don't tend to at times, but not not as much as we're going to do today, Oscar. Um, but on that topic, uh, your father's had a huge influence on you. It's, it sounds like it, and from what you said before, in the work you're doing now, what in your life has influenced that? What what's happened that that shaped the person we meet today? Uh, growing up in a school which was near the Sydney Immigration Centre, so when people arrived in Sydney, they arrived in a place called Villawood, which was very close to where I went to school. And the school I went to had 23 nationalities. Uh, it was a very vibrant, diverse community of people who were fleeing Vietnam, Cambodia, Laos, and all the wars happening around the time of the Vietnam War. In South America, people fleeing um, military regimes, whether that was in Brazil or Argentina or Chile, and equally from Eastern Europe and Western Europe as well. So we, we all played card games together. We always played the Italian card game called Briscola, which is kind of a game that's played in pairs and each home country would form their own team. So they'd speak in their home language and occasionally someone would be short of a player. So I'd jump in and fill in the other team, which meant we had to kind of signal somehow or we'll communicate in a way that was known to them. I learned very quickly how to read body language when people were speaking in their home country because they're very relaxed and they give away a lot. So I think that influenced me pretty early on, although I didn't know it. The other thing that influenced me very early on that I didn't realize till later was I had a jaw like a werewolf. If you can imagine a fist in front of your face, that's how far my jaw protruded from its current position, which meant uh, I had braces on my teeth for the best part of five and a half years. Most people might have them on for two years or three years if they've really you know, got some work to do. Um, yeah, but mine was five and a half years and I didn't want to draw attention to myself, Jonathan. So I just asked lots of questions to deflect attention from people looking at my face, talking to me. So I got really good at asking questions and realized quite quickly that people love to talk about themselves. People love to talk about their favorite topics. They'll tell you a lot. And then if I zoom in, the workplace moment was in April of 2008, 2008, which was the budget setting meeting between Sydney, Seattle, and Singapore. Our global, regional, and local offices were doing a video conference with 18 people. And it's a 19-minute meeting. And 20 minutes into that meeting, my local vice president, Tracy, she looked me straight in the eye. And that was the honey, we need to talk moment. She said, Oscar, I need to talk to you immediately after this meeting. Now, ironically, <laughs> I didn't listen to anything that was said for the rest of the meeting. And all I was trying to figure out was how many weeks of salary have I got left in my bank account and who do I need to call because I'm about to get fired. The meeting finished 20 minutes early, finished at the 70-minute mark. And as everybody filed out of the room, I too tried to file out of the room. And Tracy carefully, calmly, skillfully said to me, hey, Oscar, don't forget to close the door when you come back. And as I walked back, she said to me, as I was stepping towards the boardroom table, she says, you have no idea what you did at the 20-minute mark, do you? I thought, great, I'm getting fired and I don't even know why. Now, I sat down and faced her, and what she said next was the most profound thing I've ever heard, and yet it's not, it's not what my mind processed and what I listened to. Tracy said, if you could code how you listen, you could change the world. What I heard was, woohoo, I've still got a job. <laughs> There's an interesting lesson in that for leaders who think they've communicated a message consistently. And, and the learning is really simple. People are going to catch whatever you communicate as a message where they're at, not where your message is at. This is why it's so critical that as leaders who communicate change, 
and and help an organization to make a bigger impact our message needs to be put in a context of a story because everyone will take their own meaning out of it now tracy said something really powerful don't get me wrong she said if you could code the way you listen you could change the world and since then i've always say the difference between hearing and listening is the action you take. I've been very diligent, not in coding how I listen, but in coding how the best listeners in the world listen, whether that's our quiz with 28,000 people or the podcast or the three books or the jigsaw puzzle game or all the things we've created for the audiences we serve. And I think, honestly, Jonathan, that moment... It took me a while to get my wheels on, but that moment, looking back in that moment, I, I can remember two weeks later, two weeks later, I'd forgotten all about this listening caper and our finance director came up to me, Brian, and he said, Oscar, can you come and audit my listening in my team meeting? I said, Brian, I, I've, I have not got time for this listening caper that you and Tracy have dreamed up because I got a big uplift in my budget. Honestly, Brian, I wasn't listening to most of the budget meeting and it obviously cost me. And he said, look, <clears throat> Oscar, I can't fix your budget number, but we can invest for growth. And I heard that. And I said, Brian, where do you want me to be? And what time is it? <clears throat> and in that meeting with Brian, that was the first time I actually coded. I started to keep account of how many people were speaking, how long were they speaking, Brian asked a lot of really long and complicated questions. Uh, I'm not sure they're answering the question he asked. And, and I looked at my piece of paper and I just went, oh, my God, I'm coding how to listen. <laughs> so that, that's what stuck. That was the little bit of kindling that lit the flame that now we're on a quest to create 100 million deep listeners in the world, Jonathan. I don't think that's going to be a problem because there's so much interest in what you do and I'm fascinated by it. And I am, as I discussed with you in, in a few of the CEO and top team offsites that I'm going to be running in the next four months, I will be using some things you're teaching me now. And, and for those who are listening around the world in about 125 different countries, You shared with me some tips and techniques for listening in groups. W would you share for their benefit? I, I loved the, the four points that you made with the bonus. Do you want to just share what they are so people can really listen, not just hear? Yeah. So let, let's set up the context first. There's kind of three ways you can generally listen. You can listen one-on-one -on -one to two people, two humans in a conversation or groups. And then the third is listening at a systemic level. This is listening to hundreds of thousands of conversations going on in a, in a particular way that you might codify it. Might be a customer satisfaction survey. It may be a general election. It may be an employee engagement survey. That, that, that's the most complex and yet potent listening. If we believe that leaders set the culture for the organization, it, it's not the minutes in the meetings that matter, it's the moments in the meetings that matter. And if we're not listening for those moments, we're likely to miss some rocket fuel that can help accelerate what we're trying to achieve. So, whether I'm listening to board meetings, whether I'm listening to executive meetings, my orientation is always the first question. By the 25% mark of time in that meeting or in that agenda item, has everyone spoken and who has not? A good host, a good chair will get the participants to listen to the host or the chair. Yet great meeting hosts get the participants to listen to each other. So tip number one is notice who hasn't spoken. Now, am I suggesting everyone needs to speak on every agenda item all the time? 
Maybe yes, maybe no. It depends on the agenda item. But it's a simple heuristic that if it's an executive team or a board team, everybody has a useful perspective to share. So at that elevation, my answer would be there needs to be a very good reason why you're not seeking 100% participation. At number two, notice your question to statement ratio, whether you're the host of the meeting or notice the participants. Particularly if two of the participants are in dialogue and they're bouncing off each other with a, what I call the question and answer ping pong. They ask a question, they give an answer, they ask a question, they give an answer. Often they're answering a different question. So one of the things you want to notice is how many clarification questions are taking place during dialogue? I heard this in the question. Is that what you mean? Oh, yes, Jonathan, I heard that. But what I actually want to know is, and there's always a code word, what I actually, the actually word, what I actually want to know is this nuance on that. But if we're not asking the clarifying questions, we're going to have a very energetic debate about the wrong thing. So question to statement ratio. And for nuance, notice how many questions are clarifying questions before they provide the answer. Then um, question number three, or heuristic number three that I use is, are the statements or questions being posed from the perspective of that individual their department, their function, what they're responsible for? Or is the question helpful or the statement helpful for the entire group, the organisation? Does that question lift the consciousness of the entire group or does it just make them look like an expert? So they're the three tips. For bonus points, you can always put an overlay on, is the dialogue exclusively internal or external? What should the right balance be? Should we be talking more about customers and competitors, markets and regulators, or should we be talking more about internal systems and investment? Only a skillful chair or, or a CEO will be able to adjust accordingly, but they're the three tips mm. with a bonus. Mm. I, I love Which that. one do you think is most useful for you? Um, they're all <laughs> invaluable. I, I think... Um really sort of building on that and what I've seen work. We, we talked about Nancy Klein, who introduced me uh, to your work, even though you haven't ever met, she found your work very profound. And uh, Lee and I have been trained by Nancy over many years. She's been a mentor. She spoke at my daughter's graduation from a Quaker school, wow. which was very special, very special. In fact, my daughter, as I say, now 30, got married um, the weekend before last to Sandeep Sonny. She's now Mrs. Sonny. And, uh, the um this idea of who hasn't spoken nancy of course brings in the rounds which i i get within the first five minutes of any meeting i say if people haven't spoken they haven't joined the meeting and so even if you just begin with 30 seconds on what's working well in your work in your personal life everybody gets the chance to speak and if they don't want to because they're an introvert and susan kane's work i find invaluable is um, they can say pass and we can come back to them later. But I, I think that, that that checking on who hasn't spoken, um, I do find you have to be so, this is why the, the round is quite nice, a gentle way, and they can pass, they have permission to pass, is that you're not then hunting down the poor the poor one who's so introverted or so shy that they don't want to speak and then they, they don't want to feel pointed out. And I, I am also reflecting back to you talking about when your jaw was jutting out, those who are listening won't be able to see that there's a very handsome, very tanned fella with no jutting jaw anymore. And uh, I'm interested later on to hear how, how that was rectified uh, to a way that cosmetically people don't worry about looking at your jaw. They listen to you instead, because I've got a couple of very interesting leaders who've got um, teeth that have become so, as the jaws shrink, of course, with what we eat these days, there's a whole story with one of your guests uh, who I listened to on your podcast. Um, 
uh, it wasn't Patrick McEwen. James Nestor. James Nestor, who's a, they're, they're both yeah. on breathing. This idea about how our jaws become so cramped. Anyway, their teeth have become so cramped and jagged. It's like the Himalaya mountains. And the problem I find is I'm looking at their teeth and not listening to what they're saying. And I find myself distracted. So I'm uh, interested in your thought on that later on. However, uh, that was useful. Who hasn't spoken? The the statement to question ratio um, is very interesting as one who is doing that right now. Uh, so I'm conscious of that. The third thing I took away about whether you're lifting the consciousness of the room, the podcast, or you're trying to show how smart you are, you're the, and I come across this quite a lot, you know, trying to be the cleverest person in the room, that I find the the sort of time to think counsel very good, where everybody shares the problems they have, and then you go for one of them, and everybody else shares their wisdom and experience to help that person think well. And that really, they go, wow, the others have got really good things. If only I'd listened to them before, they could have taught me so much to solve my own problem. And the the fourth bonus one you had as a sort of concept, this external or internal system, I've seen people use the empty chair with a cardboard cutout of the regulator or a customer. And they anybody can go and sit in that chair and speak as if they're the customer and go, guys, I've just been listening to this conversation. And no one's talked about me as a customer. You've all been talking about your own money and your own areas and how much bonus you're going to get. What about me? And so that empty chair allows people to go, to be to ask the awkward question from the customer. Um, so those are some of my thoughts. What are your thoughts on my thoughts? <laughs> um, I just want to come and play a bit with introvert and extrovert. I think... We need to be careful when we hear binaries. Mm. You know, it's, it's either this or it's that. So in a room of actors, I would be considered an introvert. In a room full of accountants, I would probably be considered an extrovert. So extroversion and introversion from a perceptual point of view, as opposed to the actual description, introverts get their energy by being alone, extroverts get their energy by being around others. Extroverts think by speaking, introverts think by synthesizing. My only invitation to those who label themselves or get comfort from the introvert label is this, overplayed and waiting too long to make your contribution as an introvert feels like a terrorist dropping a hand grenade in an idea that was fully formed by the group because you're coming in too late. Mm. If, if you find comfort and energy and you're a great synthesizer, um, I'll offer you this simple phrase. And the simple phrase is this. My idea is not fully formed, but I think it's important to share for the progress of the group on this idea. Is it okay to share? Because a lot of the time what the introvert is doing, and again, I'm uncomfortable with a label, but everybody kind of feels comfortable with it. So let's chat. They're polishing it. But by the time they've polished it, it is a spectacular diamond, but its usefulness as a diamond is as a piece of jewellery rather than something functional that can cut through an idea like a laser. Introverts, please ask yourself this. If you've got a powerful question, write it down. Then ask yourself this question. Is this question helpful for the group right now? If it is, don't perfect it. Ask it you will increase the performance of the team dramatically. They won't waste energy in going down a dark corridor that's not useful to them because you are too busy being stuck in your own head worrying about what they think. Increase the consciousness of the room, get it in early. That That's the heuristic. Mm. Has everybody mm. spoken in the first 25% of the meeting? I love that. I love that. Yeah. It, you had a, I could see a supplementary coming through. No, no. Are you sure? Yeah, I'm pretty sure. <laughs> <laughs> no, thank you for that. And and even in that uh, that light switch on off sort of introvert extrovert. That of course someone's added in as you always get the ambivert, the sort of bit in the middle where sometimes you're like this and sometimes you're like that. 
But I, I find myself, just like you say, it, it is this perception of the others that you're with and, and who am I to contribute? I've got nothing to, to gather. And this is what I love about the thinking environment question. Uh, where you've got a group of people and they each bring a live issue to the wisdom of the group. Uh, I had one with a nuclear submariner and he went, I've got this problem about uh, getting enough nuclear trained submarine naval ratings. We're short of them. How do I do this? And the other guys who were bankers and CEOs of charities and things, whoa, 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 you know, like we know nothing about nuclear. And I just said, look, just trust the process. Share your wisdom and experience when you have a problem, but listen to his question. And this is the thing that I've learned from you and Nancy and others. The quality of the question decides the quality of people's thinking afterwards and the conversation that you have. And therefore, a poorly worded question, you'll be off all over the place and you'll need lots of clarity and clarifying questions because you're not really sure. And and so I think that concept of can you say that in fewer words and fewer words and fewer words down to, as you say, just what what is that? Just that nugget in the bottom of the uh, of the bowl, that little bit of gold, which is what should I do about this or how do I do that so that people can then share their thinking. Uh, and the other thing you've triggered in me is how important it is for people who are more synthesizing to be given the question they've got to be thinking about in a meeting in enough time beforehand to really mull it over and talk with their own team. Because I think you've brought great skills in getting better meetings. I mean, do you want to just say how, how you've seen the techniques and the heuristics and the principles helping meetings become better? Just perhaps share some of your top three tips for better meetings. Well, well let's go to that submariner. And the question, how, how do I find more nuclear trained, whatever it was? Um, one of the roles of the host holding that group together and for host insert executive and for host insert manager and for host insert chair, whoever is holding the process of the meeting. One, one of the reasons why dialogue isn't as effective as it could be is that people talk too much first about the ingredients rather than the recipe and the menu. So the menu, what's your favorite meal, Jonathan, if you would go out to a restaurant? No, that'd be an interesting one. I, I think it's uh, salmon, broccoli, uh, spinach, and sort of, Healthy foods, okay. yeah, yeah. Yeah, but it's cooked in a particular way, though. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How is it cooked? Um, I think I like it um, oven roasted with some herbs mm. and some spices. Um, mm. and, and I need the vegetables nice and crisp and not yeah. too soggy. Yeah. And for those of us who are listening, the first description of ingredients didn't really create any great appetite and we, we were struggling to connect but the minute you start talking about oven roasted and herbs and crispy i guarantee you jonathan everybody listening will be salivating literally their saliva glands will be activated as a result and as leaders if you just talk about the ingredients in the conversation and don't talk about the recipe and the menu. And in fact, you should be talking about the menu first. Typically menu items, eight words or less, and they're very descriptive. Yeah, so when we got to the oven roasted and the herbs and all of that. The second bit is the process, the recipe. It's the framework through which we want to dialogue through. You mentioned earlier on the example of... Um, the regulator, you haven't even talked about me and I'm in the room, okay? So in the setup of the process, you'd say, over there is a chair. Over there is a chair with a regulator. We want their perspective to be relevant in the meeting. Again, in this circle that you talked about with the thinking process, maybe there was an opportunity to put a chair and allow 
our wonderful um, submariner to describe who's actually in the chair, not because that's part of the process of the thinking environment, but it creates a process and a context for people to go, oh, okay, I can relate to this conversation and be helpful. And then we can get into the dialogue. So my tip from all of that is, as the host, it's not your job to notice the content. I sit in some very complex meetings with actuaries in insurance companies who talk in formulas that are in Greek language, literally in Greek. And I have no idea what they're talking about at all. And I'll relate an episode of a story that I was part of in this workshop. So in this organization, they have sales and distribution in the insurance company. Their job is to basically focus on customer and competitor. And at the back of the business is the actuary to calculate the lifetime cost of this and the lifetime price for this. They're very risk averse. They spend up to five years in their degree they are very smart when it comes to maths. I was brought in by the CEO and said, can you just observe this meeting because they're just butting heads. And the reason they're butting heads is because one team is saying green, green, green. And the other team is just saying a version of red, red, red all the time. And they would always argue about a particular thing. The meeting went from 9 till 10.30, and at 10.20, the CEO asked Oscar to make an observation, and my observation was this. I'm going to ask you to get into pairs when you come back from the morning break, and in those pairs, I want you to, so we are red and agreeing together, you need to argue the other person's position, not why they're wrong, but why they're right. This is a process. If you know the other party's position better than them, you can probably adopt a much higher perspective that is more impactful for the organisation. Now, there are versions of this. It doesn't have to be actuaries. Um, men are from Mars and women are from Venus, all those kind of funny stories that they say about people. You know, they put them into boxes. Uh, we come back after this simple exercise and I ask everybody to put one sticky note on the wall about what they've learned. Everybody did, except one group. And they said this, we have been making an assumption about the pricing model, which was some Greek alphabet number that we've discovered is completely wrong. And you could hear the air expand in the room as they explained this. I had no idea what they were talking about. What we've come to realize is we're both arguing incorrectly against this. And we decided to argue as the competition. We didn't follow your guidance, Oscar. We took it to a different place, which is great. The meeting was for a whole day. The meeting finished at 11.30 and they were in market with their new pricing within a month rather than a quarter. Mm -hmm. If you can hold a process, not get focused in the content, not in the debate, but holding a framework where people can dialogue effectively, they will amaze you. But a lot of leaders go, oh, this is the agenda item for today. We have 30 minutes to discuss the return to office policy since COVID. Well, you can imagine a room of 12 people over 30 minutes, you're going to have a wide, wide, wide variety of opinions and probably not an effective conversation. If you're the leader and you say, we need to discuss the return to work policy, we're going to divide the room into four key stakeholder groups. I want the, to get together. I want you to represent the employee's perspective. I want you to represent the competitive perspective, the customer perspective, and some other perspective. That meeting will be much more effective because you've shown them the recipe to have the conversation in. Too many leaders miss the gold 
and the opportunity to take performance to another level by simply having an agenda item without the process being clearly laid out. Effective chairs will say, this part of the agenda is about a decision we make. This part of the meeting is about a discussion we need to have, or this part of the agenda is informational only. That's a good example of process. But I, that's very rare, Jonathan. Do you see that often? Mm, mm. Well, you've, you've triggered in me, um, I, I love that explanation about uh, arguing why the other person's position is right, um, or even s summarizing the old talking stick, summarizing the other person's point of view to their satisfaction. And that you can't start explaining yours until they've given you the thumbs up that, yes, they do feel heard. They do feel seen. Um, and that assumptions make an ass out of you and me, as they say. But but to limiting, uh, untrue limiting assumptions that we live as if they're true. And that's what stops a lot of the best listening and the, and the best thinking. But you've made me think, particularly the Australian theme, where you, I think you're in Sydney. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I'm here in Lincolnshire. And that one of the most influential exercises I ever did was called Exercise Rainbow Serpent, obviously a famous theme in Australia, um, which was the combination of an Australian army unit uh, brigade, um, which was about to go to East Timor to prevent the massacre that was going on, uh, an American army unit, our British army unit, I was the brigade chief of staff of with 120 guys, uh, a Canadian, a French Canadian army unit, and a New Zealand army unit probably the only army unit because the New Zealand army was so small that it was its brigade. But we were all trying to help them prepare for how to approach the East Timor massacre and how to go in as UN troops. And they did an amazing job. And I think they did an amazing job because of the process that we use, which was similar to what you just described it, without knowing that process. And what we did was we had a, a bit like in, World War II, where they had the bird table with pictures of Britain and the bombers coming in from Germany and the Spitfires going to face them. And, and around the bird table, we all took certain roles. The intelligence officer would play the part of the militias and the brigadier would play his part and so on. That was fine. Everybody played their part. and But then we got them to change. So the brigadier had to be the militia and the militia had to be the brigade commander and and somebody else had to be the Canadians and someone else had to be the Australians and to explain it from their side of the map. How did it look like? Because it was like when you moved around the table and you looked at the ground from their perspective, it was very different. And that you could see that light bulb moment go on where they go, ah, they're different. They're maybe not wrong or maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I've made an assumption from my perspective, and I I always do love that final line, and then I'm fascinated any thoughts that come up for you, which is like, what if we're wrong? You know, as I listen to this other person, determined in my viewpoint, and if I want your opinion, I'll give it to you, shut up and listen to me. Um, what if I'm wrong? What if we're all wrong? And and what have we been assuming? And what's the elephant in the room? Those kind of things. I don't know. What, what comes up for you, Oscar? What comes up for me is our is our jigsaw puzzle game that we play with pairs and they have 60 pieces to build a jigsaw puzzle as quickly as possible. There's only 60 pieces. They're given five minutes. And uh, what's really interesting is the instructions are very clear. The instructions are you, you if you're instructing the person constructing the jigsaw puzzle, you can't touch them or the jigsaw puzzle. What, what I ask them to do is of the five minutes, what we know is the highest performing team spend at least one minute, but usually one and a half minutes discussing how they're going to approach the task rather than jumping straight into moving the pieces around and getting them done. For 95% of groups that I work with, and we've worked with literally thousands of them, Five seconds in, they're touching the jigsaw puzzle piece. They haven't even listened to the first instruction in a workshop about listening. Then we do the debrief. And I, and I point this out. And then the next thing I say is, how many of you sat immediately next to the person making the jigsaw puzzle? And say there's a room of 20 people, 19 will be sitting next to the jigsaw puzzle maker and one 
usually an EA, a PA or an admin or some kind of support staff will stand behind the constructor so they can see the world through their eyes, not from the side. The final question I ask is, who went and looked at how the other groups are constructing their jigsaw puzzles? Again, one or two out of 20 will do this. And then for bonus points, I ask them, if you did that, did you share that knowledge with all the other groups? Because most organizations will say, we've got lots of silos and we don't know how to work across each other. So what it's prompted for me is that if you can be great with a process, you can create powerful, transformational team performance like you did with the East Timor United Nations force because the embodiment of them using their physical body to move to a different position not only changes their mindset, but because it's an embodied experience, they view the world completely differently. The final thing I was famous for in my time at Microsoft was people would often come up to me and say, hey, Oscar, I want to work on your team. And I go, great, tell me something I don't already know about my customer and come back with that insight. And they all kind of scratched their head and didn't know how to do it. But one in five people would say, well, how do you think I should go about that? I said, go to the contact center recordings and listen for an hour. Tell me what you hear. And whether it's contact center recordings, whether it's your complaint file, whether it's your exit interviews where staff have left, this is the opportunity to listen to what's not said because just because it's being recorded doesn't mean it's being actioned because the difference between hearing and listening is the action you take. So my invitation, no matter how senior you are in an organisation, mm, get as close that. to the front line as possible. The head of the public broadcaster in Australia Every week on a Friday, this is a CEO of an organization of nearly four and a half thousand people, logs in to the public telephone number and from nine till 11, listens to all the things that people who call up his organization are either complaining or complimenting them about. And there he has an amazing bank of stories that he can integrate into any change initiative because David has the currency of the voice of the customer, the voice of the employee. How well are you listening to them is my invitation, no matter how senior you are. These are not PowerPoint slides, pie charts, graphs, and verbatims on a slide. These are real conversations you've had with real customers. Wow. I love that. And what, Many CEOs that I work with, you know, a few stand out. One that particularly stands out who's been on this podcast is Matt Oppenheimer, the CEO of Remitly Global, based in Seattle. And uh, I think I'll have to get you to talk to one of their sessions um, because, or maybe listen to one of their sessions and then talk afterwards what you noticed. Um, don't we go for, isn't that interesting how the default is to go to talk before we go to listen and then talk? Um, I've even, you're even training me as we go along. I'm catching myself. Um, but what he does do is every month he will go and listen in to uh, part of the customer success team. He even will actually go on one of the calls to take the customer's dissatisfaction with what goes on, listen to them and hear them out uh, and uh, aim to rectify their problem. But he is current, as you said, uh, with the voice of the, uh, customer and also the voice of the employee. So I think that's it's really powerful. Wow, Oscar, there's so much we can talk about. You did say to me before, talking about questions and listening, you wanted to know the voice of my podcast guests and some of the CEOs that I work with, what questions they had for you. Are you hmm. are you up for that? I've got th three different CEOs, three different questions. Uh, the first Wonderful. one was... Um, Oscar, what are your top three practices for listening well? So, Jonathan, I want to just share with you and the audience 
a, a technique. There are three questions here. I may serve the group better by hearing all three together and provide some level of synthesis. I may not, but when you have questions, uh, particularly if you're in a room, get all the questions out at the beginning so you can listen systemically to the themes that are emerging rather than trying to answer each, which is a really time inefficient way to do it. Mm. Now, I may end up, you know, crashing into my own airbag here and having to answer all three, but let me hear the other two. I mean, that's a great, that's a great observation, even in itself. And, <laughs> and again, I think about um, when we're trying to design a Dan's ad at the end of a meeting, decision and action, a next step, who's accountable, a delivery deadline. The, when the leader proposes their first draft solution, this is what I'm suggesting. How committed are you by thumbs? And and he wants a thumbs up if they're fully committed to his decision, action, next step, who's accountable and delivery deadline. Thumbs sideways if they're not quite there and a thumbs down if they're, if they're deeply against it. And then his question is, what will it take to make it a thumbs up? And he goes around and he listens to everybody, doesn't answer them all, just as you said. And when he's heard everybody's, then systemically he can answer the question. So love that, Oscar. And the second and the third question from different CEOs was, who was your most informative podcast guest? By informative, what did you learn the most about listening from them? Who was your most informative podcast guest? And the third one linked to that was from another leader. Who is the best listener as a leader that you know? Okay. So uh, the first question I'll take is the middle question so we can cascade effectively here. Um, the best listener who's listened to me who's been a podcast guest is completely blind. And we conducted the entire podcast interview with him on a selfie stick on an iPhone. And he gave me a tour of his home and the communities part of, showed me his cat and all these kinds of things. But I always ask this question at the end of the recording, what did you notice about my listening? And Daniel Kirsch, he was listening at a level that just blew me away. It humbled me. He talked about my vocal variation. He talked about uh, the kind of language I was using and explained that I was using language in a very cultured way that I was very consciously trying to be helpful for the audience. And he was hearing all of this whilst walking around and I was freaking out as a podcast host because I'm going, oh, the audio is going to be all over the place and how useful is this going to be for the, and it wasn't any of those things. But Daniel, without a sense, was a, with the absence of sight, was able to listen on a very profound level. And I wouldn't separate them. Dame Evelyn Glenny from Scotland, who's a world-class percussionist, and both these people have got TED Talks, so you can look them up. Um, she had a de degenerative disease, and by the age of 12, she was profoundly deaf. She conducted the whole interview with me, lip-reading me. And although the software I had had captioning on it to uh, for accessibility reasons, um, she was able to say things like, your vocal variation, you've obviously had some training with a voice coach, Oscar. And like I was literally in the middle of training with a voice coach at that time, and I just thought, wow. So sometimes I think the absence of a sense heightens the others. I have done no study in that, but other people have commented on that to me. And the point I want to make for the, uh, for that person who asked that question is... Sometimes you'll notice people in the room in complex dialogue, their eyes are gazing or their eyes are looking at their feet or their eyes are looking at a blank piece of paper because they're auditory listeners first and visual processors second. Don't assume 
they're not engaged, they're not a team player, none of that. Be careful what signals you infer from traditional body language, particularly if you're dealing with people who either have or haven't been diagnosed on, as neurodivergent. So that, that that's the biggest learning there. My practice that I would recommend for everybody is, uh, number one, don't start meetings at the top of the hour. Start meetings five minutes after the hour, and if it's a one-hour meeting, finish them at five to the hour. It's the difference between a meeting that sounds like this. This is the top of the hour meeting. Oh, gee, Oscar, sorry I'm late. I got back-to-back -back meetings and I arrived as soon as I could. Sorry, I know it's five after the hour, but I, you've got my complete and utter attention. Or the meeting is scheduled at five after the hour. Gee, Oscar, I really love coming to your meetings because I've got time to just visit the bathroom, collect my thoughts and... I'm here now and I'm really looking forward to how we can make this a productive meeting. There are two people arriving at exactly the same time, but because you're controlling and setting the process up as the host, it's the difference between arriving frantically at five after the hour or arriving consciously at five after the hour, looking forward to the conversation. So that, that's a big tip in terms of before the meeting. During the meeting, just please drink water whenever you get distracted. You should be drinking a glass of water roughly every half an hour. And then the third tip I would give you is notice your breathing. So whether you're a special ops in the military, Navy SEAL, whether you're an opera singer or an Olympic athlete, there's a very tight correlation between breath control and performance. And if you can notice your breathing, you will shut down all the browser tabs in your mind that are chewing up memory that isn't available for the conversation. I always give a bonus. <laughs> so, for, so for bonus if you do set up the five minute and the five minute either side play some music before you go into the meeting and I guarantee you that will recharge your listening batteries much quicker than any technique that you've been taught because most of us go into conversations with our listening battery on yellow or red if you listen to about two and a half minutes of music doesn't matter what sort the way I listen to music, I listen what music will be helpful for the purpose of the meeting and who I'm meeting with. So sometimes that's a really high energy music and sometimes it's not. But don't overthink it. Just play some music. Again, it will rewire, shut down those browser tabs pretty quickly. If you do have time, just go for a walk around the office. Wow. Well, firstly, now, thank you. Thank you. So I'm you, not you, sure I covered off question number three because I've forgotten it. <laughs> you remind me of, was it that that famous one about the one thing I find, I'm, I'm four years older than you, the one thing I find as I get older is uh, three things happen. The first is I start to lose my memory. I can't forget what, I can't remember what the next two are. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I yeah. think the important part is to admit it. <laughs> Who is the best leader? Uh, the best leader you know who's a really good listener. I think you've mentioned a couple you had on your guest, but as a leader that we might yeah, have heard uh, of. Oh, as a leader that the audience might have heard of. I am thinking, so bear with me. Mm-hmm. Look, and I'll still come back to Tracy Fellows who listened to me in that moment. Um, many managers had listened to me asking the same question I asked at the 20-minute mark. And the question was boring, repetitive, and simple. But Tracy realized the value of that question in that moment. And, and Tracy's gone on to big, complex, global roles in 
property organizations and retailers as well as at, at Microsoft. And I, I think it's her presence in the moment. When you are meeting with Tracy, there is a lot on Tracy's plate. But in that moment, there is nobody she's paying attention to. There is no device she's paying attention to. There's no issue. She's in the moment giving her full and undivided attention to the conversation that's taking place right now. And to me, that's an extraordinary skill. But more importantly, it was a wonderful gift that she noticed in that moment because she didn't listen to what I say, I said in that moment. She listened to what I meant. And when you can listen to what people mean, not just what they say, you, as leaders, you get immensely more discretionary effort. And more importantly, they'll tell others in your organization and beyond about it as well. So I'd it's difficult for me to go past Tracy as mm. a leader who's a very, very skilled listener. Tracy Fellows. Well, thank Tracy you. Fellows. And talking of, of people, um, I, I have noticed, particularly on this podcast, uh, the skills that you've developed in your tone, pitch, and speaking <laughs> that I've really enjoyed hearing what's happened. So who is your speaking coach. Oh, again, you're going to test my memory. We're going back five years. It's a lady. Her name is Lisa, and she's an opera singer, mm -hmm. and she teaches people how to find their voice. And uh, the kinds of exercises Lisa got me to do um, were not about voice control in the first instance. It was about this story that I was telling myself that I'm too slow, I'm too monotoned, I'm too this, I'm too that. And Lisa, again, listened skillfully to me and she, yeah, she could work on my vocal range and timbre and all the things that matter in creating vocal variation so you pay attention to me. But I couldn't get there until she dealt with the stories that I've been telling myself that were really, really unproductive. Lisa was able to unlock the story about this boy who didn't want to be part of the conversation because he had a werewolf's jaw. Hmm. She went straight there and she worked with that for at least four meetings before we were able to actually work on breathing technique and all the other things that can help you speak in a way that's more engaging. And I'm forever grateful to her and uh, her ability to unlock a story that was holding me back mm. because many of us have got unproductive stories. <laughs> oh, haven't we just, and, and thinking of what, um, and observing what people who can watch the YouTube will see, um, they, they'll see, as I say, this handsome fellow who hasn't got a werewolf jaw, who's got a scar on his forehead, which I'd like to hear the story of that one, and who has some lovely candles burning in the back, which makes it a lovely ambiance to the room. So quickly tell us the stories of those three. Oh, look, the uh, scar on the head is a cricket ball. Uh, at the age of 14, uh, trying to play a shot that was probably a bit too advanced for me. And uh, a cricket ball, for those who don't know, is a piece of leather with cork at about uh, a speed that can do some damage. So that uh, that's where the scar has come from. Uh, the ball actually bounced off my nose and into my head then. Uh, this is in a world before helmets. Uh, the... It, background is deliberately curated with some help from um, my granddaughter. So the bookshelf is color-coded by Ruby uh, when she was eight. And uh, the, the candles are there again to create some kind of distraction in the background to go, hey, this is a real place. The candles aren't battery operated. And it's just a signal, say, if you get bored or looking at me, you can relax and look at the candles. 
And and how did you manage to get the jaw sorted? What did, what was the operation? It must have been a long one. Uh, no, it was a very mechanical process. In fact, the only operation that took place was by a periodontist who removed um, four teeth at the front of my uh, face that were impacted. So they were literally growing in the wrong direction to each other. So that took uh, three months to pull out all those teeth because they were literally the size of my index finger. And if you put your index finger up near your jaw, you can kind of see how high that might go up. Mm. And um, occasionally I get some sinus issues and I can still feel the gaps up there. Then a set of braces were placed on my teeth and literally wound in every three months. Wow. And very deliberately, very slowly. And I've, I've never taken any headache um, medication or anything like that. Both my mum and my wife say I've got a very high pain tolerance, which is good for some things, but really bad for injury management if you're a runner or a swimmer. Story sure. for another day. <laughs> and yeah, typically orthodontics are in place for kind of maximum three years, kind of minimum two years. Mine was five and a half years. So that was, and um, the orthodontics were very uh, heavy because they had to push not only the teeth back, but slowly move the jaw back as well. That was wow. connected to. Wow. Yeah. Well, a, a lot of, a lot of uh, pain management. I'm, I'm deeply impressed. And at some stage, and I think we're going to have to have another podcast in a year's time or something, because <laughs> you've got so much to share. Um, particularly with your um, running that you love doing. I seem to remember you told me you'd done an ultra, 100 kilometres, was that right? Yeah, twice, yeah, because yeah. I, I couldn't. I did, it, I did it the first time with four people, then I did it with the same four people the next time, and then I trained two teams the subsequent next three years. So um, as the coach, you probably end up doing a little bit more than the team actually does as you kind of circle back. But uh, yeah, my happy place is in the bush with no tracks and, you know, a compass. So oh, well, these days it's GPS, but yeah. And, and just being at one with nature and listening to your body and being connected with the earth and the rivers. And you're just uh, completely alive in that moment. There's no there's no excuses. There's no options. You have to be present. If not, you'll break your leg. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, uh, I just want to thank you as well. Before we just go on to talk about a uh, favorite book and then your top two minute top tip just at the end, that mm. um, thanks to you knowing that we had today's session, I went and walked with the dogs in nature. Um, I'm very much like uh, you encourage people to do a great believer in walking meetings, you know, forest bathing with somebody else. You listen better and you think well, either on your own or mm. with someone else. But uh, the other thing that I got back to doing again was uh, the Heart Math Institute have a little EM Wave Pro, which looks at your heart rate variance. And I, I did that before I came on to the session to get myself coherent in a coherent state the the inner balance which i haven't been doing for a while and i noticed that my sleep the um the deep sleep and the rem sleep since i did a 500 kilometer uh, endurance bike ride it took a lot out of me and and that's all gone away i've lost that that kind of capacity so i need to get back to uh inner balance um so mm. I, th I think before you listen to people to get yourself balanced whether the music or uh, coherence, I think is a good tip from you, which I've been practicing. So Oscar, uh, favorite book, apart from William, do you want to mention William Dalrymple's The Anarchy perhaps, or is it another book that you recommend on leadership? And then we'll do the top tip. Well, I, I love, look, William Dalrymple's book on the anarchy is, is the, the first global organization, which was too big to fail, which is the East India Company. And uh, there's there's wonderful lessons for all kinds of perspectives culturally, uh, as leaders, as commercial leaders, as um, people who are thinking about the legacy they're going to leave. Uh, this book traces uh, Mongol India from the 1500s all the way through to the exit of the uh, of Britain in the, the 1940s and uh, Indian becoming a republic. But the book I love and recommend to many people is called The Tower and the Square by Neil Ferguson, who's a Scottish academic. And uh, it talks about the difference between hierarchical power and collective power and gives examples through the centuries that each is an evolution of the other 
And when one system has too much power in a hierarchical system, how the collective overcomes it. Sometimes we call it revolution, but it's not always revolution. And he has a, 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 an amazing ability to research stories from the Medici times of Venice all the way back to the Greeks and then all the way forward to modern times. And uh, if you ever get a chance to listen to him talking about the book, he's uh, incredibly articulate about that. But if you're a leader who's looking to increase their leadership flexibility, this book will show you when it's appropriate to use each model. Mm. Fantastic. So, uh, Oscar, I, I've really enjoyed having you on the program. The breadth, width, and depth of of uh, what you bring uh, to the people listening is phenomenal. I think Dennis Healy would describe it as hinterland, uh, deep into the bush, uh, mm. to use your analogy from the coast. Um, so let's uh, end with you introducing yourself, explaining who you are, your name, and what you do, if you can capture that in a nut uh, in a thumbnail uh, sketch, that would be great. And your top leadership tip for people listening around the world. G'day, I'm Oscar Trimboli, and along with the Deep Listening Ambassador community, we are on a quest to create 100 million deep listeners in the workplace. My number one tip for leaders is stop listening to what people say. Start noticing what they don't say. And when you do, you'll start to hear what they think and what they mean, and you'll have an exponential impact, not only for your leadership, but for the way they view themselves and their future, and you'll create a legacy worth moving towards. Fantastic. Well, Oscar Tripoli, thank you very much from us all, and particularly from myself for touching my life and the life of the people that I am blessed to work with, and keep making a difference with the 100 million. Thank you. Thanks for listening.